Oder ich möchte mal so formulieren, das mit dem Bösen. Or I would like to put it this way. It is used by people who no longer have arguments, who no longer have reasons to judge a conflict or its development. That's what it's about. Evil is a term that is practical for people who no longer have arguments. They simply say that is the evil one. With that, they place themselves in a space where no cognitively clear assignment is possible anymore. That is the problem. Hallo zusammen und willkommen auf Neutrality Studies. Hello everyone and welcome to Neutrality Studies. Today I have Dr. Helmut Schaben with me for the second time, a long-time German and Swiss journalist who was an editor and reporter at Swiss Television from 1993 to 2012, including 16 years at the Tagesschau. Dr. Schaben recently published a wonderful article, the content of which I have long wanted to make an episode about. It concerns the idea that one can only be or should only be neutral when there is no war anywhere. Admittedly, this is a silly idea, but there are people who seem to really think that. They are currently arguing in Switzerland that neutrality is no longer appropriate when there is an aggressor who needs to be punished. Mr. Schaben has dissected this argument and points out the critical issue, namely that at the beginning of a war, there are always lies that bend the truth. That's what we want to talk about today. Darüber wollen wir heute reden. Herr Schäben, willkommen zurück. Ja, guten Morgen. Ja. Mr. Schäben, welcome back. Yes, good morning. It's interesting, when I opened the newspaper this morning, I read a comment by Joseph Lang, known as Joe Lang in Switzerland, a historian who was a Swiss parliamentarian, a National Council member of the Greens. And he writes the same nonsense again. Namely, he writes, if I may quote here, Neutrality that treats aggressors and the attacked equally is unfair and unjust. That's what the people who published this manifesto recently said. Manifesto for the 21st century, a grand title. That is complete nonsense, because as a historian, Joe Lang should also know, if he goes through the last 200 or 300 years of history, that the first casualty in war is the truth. This is a banality that is repeated by all journalists in every war. In most wars that I personally remember in my journalistic life, it is very difficult to determine who the aggressor is, or there are lies so blatant that it is obvious. The true intentions of the warring parties are obscured by propaganda, and that is where the problem lies. Of course, that is the problem. But the other problem is also that if we follow the argumentation of Mr. Joe Lang and the others who wrote this manifesto, we find ourselves in a difficult situation. I just want to briefly mention a bit of self-promotion. They published this manifesto at the end of May. It has exactly the same form as the manifesto that I created together with Verena Tobler and Wolf Lindner in January to push in the other direction. We both campaigned for signatures. Our concept of neutrality is of course quite different. Unsere Konzeption der Neutralität ist natürlich eine ganz andere. Man ist neutral, wenn es Krieg gibt und dann schaut man nicht. One is neutral when there is war and then one does not look at who started it. Instead, one says in principle, no, we do not assign blame. We now declare our neutrality and then work with the warring parties as best as we can. This vision, which is represented by this other group, is quite different. One is neutral, but at best still neutral for the attacked party. It is already said that one chooses who is good and who is evil. One stands on the side of the good. This is also in the tradition of the just war theory, the theory of a just war. And the problem is, of course, that you can't apply it consistently. You write that in your article as well. So how would you have done it in the Iraq war, where it was definitely clear that the Americans were the bad guys and the Iraqis were the ones being attacked? The Iraqis should have been supported. Should Iraq have been supported in that case? And these people usually have no answer to that. 
or they say it can't be compared because Saddam Hussein was evil. Even if he was attacked, he was an evil person and had to die, and it was good that he is dead. Yes, it's fundamentally about the wording, isn't it? What is evil? Evil is, let's say, a moral religious category that eludes cognitive categories. Historians, analysts, or any rational consideration of things work with these categories. People who are committed to enlightenment and do not argue with religious or faith-based questions cannot do anything with evil. It is a category of ambiguity. The moment I bring evil into play, it becomes very simple. Or let me put it this way. Evil is used by people who no longer have an argument, who no longer have reasons to judge a conflict or its development. That's what it's about. Evil is a term that is practically used by people who no longer have arguments. They simply say, that's the evil one. By doing so, they place themselves in a space where no cognitively clear assignment is possible anymore. That's the problem. When George Bush attacked Afghanistan, I remember very well that he gave a speech to the nation. He said something like, America had been attacked and was in a monumental battle of good against evil. This is our fight. Right there, he escapes rational assignments. Not to mention that the decision of the National Security Council at that time was not to give the U.S. government a free hand against terrorism, but that did not mean war. There should have been a normal police investigation of these 9-11 incidents. That was the idea. And there should have been an extradition process if it was about Osama bin Laden. It is known today that the Taliban even said, we have Osama bin Laden, we will also extradite him. But you have to initiate a proper extradition process. And you have to prove to us, you have to provide us with evidence that Osama bin Laden is responsible for this 9-11 attack. The Americans refused to do this and simply said, either you immediately extradite all terrorists without even naming names or we will attack. And then they attacked and waged this war. And this Afghanistan war is one thing. It is terrible, but it is the best supported internationally, even by the UN Security Council. So that is still the best case scenario for the Americans, which can be legitimized the most. But what comes after? In 2003, the attack on Iraq was not only fabricated and lied about with the weapons of mass destruction. We know today that it was known back then that it was fabricated and lied about, because even the US intelligence agencies told the president that there was most likely nothing there. And we remember Donald Rumsfeld, who made that stupid statement, that is not even logically coherent. The absence of evidence is not the same as the evidence of absence. Such a thing doesn't even make logical sense. But that was trumpeted, and then the Security Council and everyone else were lied to. There was also no resolution, no legitimization for an intervention, and yet this war was waged. In my opinion, the Iraq war is several levels more illegal in terms of justification than, for example, Russia's war against Ukraine. Russia at least has a line of argument, a legitimization that I do not share and do not endorse. I do not endorse it. But one can see how Russia says, we recognize the Donbas republics as states, and we are helping in accordance with UN Charter Article 51, only in defense. UN Charter Artikel 51 helfen nur beim Verteidigen. Das ist das ganze Rational. Rational. Yeah. Und das yeah. hat noch nicht mal existiert. That is the whole rationale. And that didn't even exist in the Iraq war. Not even that existed. The people who then argue that one must always distinguish between good and evil, or between attacker and attacked, how do you think these people in Switzerland would argue in other wars? So, at the moment, in Israel's war of annihilation against Gaza, it is relatively clear who the victim is and who the attacker is. And Switzerland has not imposed any sanctions. Also, in terms of neutrality, 
trade with Israel continues. What do you think these people would say about that? Israel, was denkst du, wie mal wie diese Leute sich darzustellen würden? Yes, it is noticeable that the Swiss government is very reserved about the Gaza war. Hardly expresses at all. Sich nicht äußert, keine Erklärungen abgibt, hingegen ununterbrochen. Does not comment, does not give explanations, but continuously accuses Russia of waging a completely inexplicable war of aggression in Ukraine. I am speculating now, but I think that the artillery attacks on the population in Donbass in January and February that is before the Russian attack had escalated to such an extent that the pressure in Russia was very high also on Putin to act. One has to imagine it like this. The media, the Duma, hardliners like Prigozhin, who is no longer alive, but I also think people from the general staff and the military said, action must be taken, Putin must act to prevent the entire Donbass from being flattened. At that time, I consulted the OSCE website and it spoke of hundreds of shell impacts in January and February. Because the OSCE was the external organization that set up monitoring in the Donbass to oversee the ceasefire, which never really worked. But in February, the OSCE recorded many impacts in the Donbass. Yes, hundreds. So when I added it all up along the entire front line, it could have been up to a thousand shell impacts per day. And I think the pressure from even the political elite, the Duma, and from the military on Putin was also very great. He had gathered troops at the border, but I'm not sure if that wasn't also a last attempt to signal, be careful, if this doesn't stop, we will march in. He then marched in. That was clearly a mistake. If I were Putin, I wouldn't have done it. But Putin didn't ask me. So there is a certain logic in it. The Russians have been saying for 30 years that Ukraine is the red line. A NATO membership of Ukraine is the red line for us, then it will lead to a serious conflict. I have simply always asked the question, who advanced, who threatens whom, who can claim a threat? Are the Russians off the West Coast, off Los Angeles, or is NATO, the US-dominated NATO, off Sevastopol? This simple question, when answered, provides a certain understanding of the situation. Whether the Russians feel subjectively threatened or not, we cannot judge at all, nor do we need to. But they have reason to. Which head of state in the world would allow their most important naval base, like Sevastopol, to come under the influence of a hostile military alliance? No head of state in the world would remain inactive in such a situation. So in my opinion, NATO also bears a large part of the blame for the situation in Ukraine. But we actually wanted to talk about something else. No, but it all comes together. And we can also be honest and open enough to say that we are accused of being Putin sympathizers and pro-Russian because we have a strategic understanding of the Russian side. Explaining a war or a conflict is not the same as excusing it. It does not mean that we approve of it. It means that we are trying to make sense of this action-reaction scheme. We understand the logic applied on this side. We also understand the logic applied on the Ukrainian side, from a Western Ukrainian perspective, which when attacked, of course, must shoot back. What else can they do? We also have understanding for the people in Donbass, who reacted to the events of 2014 in Kiev. So we try to analyze these action-reaction mechanisms. In this context, and this is the realism I start from to deal with what is happening, we hold the opinion that neutral countries like Switzerland or Austria should not morally commit to one side. Instead, they should say it is a tragedy.
tragedy, and we mourn both sides. So we lament the suffering on both sides, but we will not expose ourselves like Germany and France by delivering weapons. We will not do that. We should also be as sparing as possible with sanctions, and not as generous as possible. However, there are other opinions in Switzerland. Some people say that is wrong. We need to take a moral stand here. Yesterday, the Ukrainian flag was hanging next to the Swiss flag in the Federal Palace. I saw the footage. That troubles me. Yes, of course. It is also not at all clear how one can so definitively identify the aggressor in the various wars of the last hundred years. That is completely impossible. A book just came to mind written by John Quigley, a law professor from Ohio. It is called The Ruses for War. In it he lists, I don't know how many, certainly 20 countries that have been attacked by the USA since the mid-20th century, partly through covert operations where it was not at all clear that the USA was involved. For example, in Indonesia in the 1950s, they hired people, Chinese, Americans, Filipinos, pilots who flew planes to support an uprising in Indonesia. They bombed there with bombers and they wore no identification marks on their uniforms. The planes were also freshly painted so that it was not visible that they were American planes. The aim was to overthrow Sukarno, a president who collaborated with the Communist Party. It was argued that this would be a danger for all of Asia if Sukarno included the Communists in his governing coalition. A regime change had to be carried out. Then they bombed there. However, an American pilot who had crashed was captured. The plane was shot down. The pilot's name was, I believe, Pope or something similar. It became clear that he was an American, an American pilot. The CIA then said that he was not their man, but a mercenary who had somehow been involved. But the matter was clear. The Americans were trying to carry out a military coup in Indonesia. It didn't work at that time, but a few years later, in the mid-1960s, Sukarno was indeed overthrown. This led to perhaps the greatest bloodbath of the entire 20th century. Several hundred thousand alleged or actual communists were simply murdered. Yes, those were absolutely terrible times, and those are warlike machinations. There are dozens of documented cases, such as the coup in Iran, orchestrated by MI6 and the CIA, which brought the Shah back in 1953. Then there is the famous example of Chile with Augusto Pinochet. We know today that Kissinger gave the OK to overthrow him with the help of the CIA and the local military. There are dozens of such cases documented in books by academics. We do not want to say now that Switzerland must sanction the USA in all these moments and choose a side, thereby harming itself. That is precisely the value of neutrality, being able to say, OK, that went badly, but I'm staying out of it now. And the fact that this is now being reversed with Russia and these other NATO wars, saying no, 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 neutrality only when we do bad things, but not when others do bad things, that doesn't work, that will not work. It also doesn't work on the international law level. I always try to make it clear to people that it's about power politics. Of course it's about power politics. The Russians too, when they intervened, in Hungary or Czechoslovakia, played with false cards. They always said they were asked for help by the respective government, which was not true. So it's about power politics. The great powers, the USA, China, Russia, are concerned with security policy, and they have their spheres of influence. It is very difficult to say, yes, we want to judge morally now, and these are the bad guys and those are the good guys. It seems to me like someone saying, I don't agree with gravity and am fighting against it.
ich bin nicht mit der Schwerkraft einverstanden und kämpfe gegen dieselbe. Aber wenn ich die nicht in Betracht ziehe, die Schwerkraft, dann kann ich vor. But if I don't take gravity into account, then I can fall flat on my face. That's the point. There is no use in always invoking international law when it comes to pure power politics. And the fact that the USA, Russia, and China want a security policy that is based on preventing the so-called enemy from getting too close to their borders or setting up missile launch pads at their borders is simply a fact that must be considered. There is absolutely no point in arguing morally there, because ultimately it is not about morality and not about international law, but about this brutal power politics. But we have to reckon with that. That is my... Das, das ist meine. Das, da bin, bin ich absolut mit dir einverstanden. Der Punkt ist der, dass diese Moral, dieses Moral. I absolutely agree with you on that. The point is that this moral argument is mostly used by those who prefer war as a means of conflict resolution. So those who say we need to shoot now, Mr. Stoltenberg literally says that weapons are the way to peace. They want peace, but they want to achieve it through their military force and through war in Ukraine. And in the way they envision it, pushing Russia back, bringing Ukraine into NATO, returning Crimea to Ukraine. That is their vision of peace. The Russians obviously have a different vision and are evidently willing and able to go to war for it. And now we have no middle ground left. There is nothing in between anymore. And the terrible thing we have learned is that the obvious solution to this conflict was the neutrality of Ukraine. And we now know, after two years, that this solution was not made impossible by Russia, but by the West. We know this today, with absolute certainty, because the Ukrainians have said so. The chief negotiators have said that in April, we had almost a solution that was great for us, and then it was not taken. The Russians have said we had a solution, the Ukrainians walked away from it, and Boris Johnson also said, yes, we told them to keep fighting. It is absolutely clear that this solution approach was made impossible. And we have the same problem in Switzerland. Neutrality naturally does not fit into this pressure mechanism desired by the West. Therefore, there are attempts, even in Switzerland, to keep neutrality as small or as low as possible. The interesting thing is that we have people in Switzerland who support this argument. They would be happy if we gave up neutrality, like one of the authors of this other appeal, Mr. Cotier. Not Mr. Giorgio, Mr. Cotier, who also said that neutrality must be overcome. Yes, a lot of work is done with false claims. These are spread among the people, and the newspapers pick them up and do not ask critical questions. I heard on the news last night, I believe it was the head of the SP faction in Parliament, in reference to this so-called peace conference now taking place at Bergenstock. If the Russians refuse to participate, then it has to be done without the Russians. She expressed herself in that direction. That is not true at all. That is simply a lie. Putin has said three or four times in the last few months that he is ready for negotiations. But not to negotiations dictated to him by the Ukrainian side, that is by Zelensky, and taking place on the Bergenstock. Then they celebrate a peace conference where one of the warring parties is not invited. That is sheer madness. I have never heard anything so stupid in my entire life. But they sell it as if it were already the first step towards peace. I have the terrible feeling that it is not currently leading to a peace agreement. The Americans and also the European allies do not want peace, but rather to continue the war in Ukraine. I happened to see an article yesterday how the one by zufällig gestern einen Artikel gesehen wieder von Dan Altman heißt der glaub einem His name is Dan Altman, I believe, a professor in the USA at Georgia University, I think. In foreign affairs, he says we must make it clear to the Russians that we are ready to continue this war 
for seven or eight years so that the Russians do not get the idea that we are not capable of continuing to fight. It is simply terrible. He argues that we must not, under any circumstances, give the Russians the impression that we want to give in or are ready to negotiate. We must make it clear to the Russians that we will continue this war for years to come. Only then will the Russian... Because as soon as we signal to the Russians that we might want peace negotiations, the Russian will be confirmed in his idea that the West is too weak and cannot hold out much longer. In seiner Idee, dass der Westen zu schwach ist und nicht mehr lange durchhält. Das ist also diese, diese uh, Ideologie, wir müssen weiter. So, this is the ideology. We must keep fighting to show strength to the opponent at the negotiating table. I'm referring to Vietnam, which is the best example. Barbara Tuchman has extensively explained in her book The March of Folly how the USA continued this Vietnam War for years against their own interests even though the top military leadership saw that they could never win this war. But it was continued because no loss of face was allowed. The march of folly is madness. It was similar in other wars. The 20-year-long Afghanistan war is exactly the same example. Yes, absolutely. It is these people who are then in power, and I call this the neoconservative leadership. Blinken is part of it, and Ms. Newland is part of it, and so on. These people view violence as a solution, and are happy with it. They deeply reject any kind of actual diplomacy. They say, no, you must not try to solve this diplomatically now, because that would show weakness. But what fascinates me the most, is that these are the people who justify their own bloodthirsty and very warlike views with morality. Morality demands it. Ansichten über Moral rechtfertigen. Die Moral gebietet es. Und deshalb ist dann eben auch Neutralität unmoralisch. And that is why neutrality is also immoral. Because those who are not on the good side are on the side of evil. And the world is black and white. The interesting thing is that in Switzerland at the moment, many people believe this nonsense. They have drunk this potion and agree with it. They are almost ashamed and say that people in Switzerland are ashamed that they are not helping Ukraine more, that they are not clearly committing, that they are not showing their colors. That is what fascinates me. What is going on in the minds of these people? These are intelligent people, really intelligent historians, international law experts, and politicians who have swallowed this narrative. And they get angry at us when they hear us speak. They get really angry. Yeah, selbstverständlich. Yes, of course. And the interesting thing is there are also countries in the European Union that are trying to take a neutral position. It's astonishing. Viktor Orban recently spoke at a mass rally in Budapest, where a million people demonstrated their support for the Orban government. Our media did not report at all on this huge rally. Viktor Orban said, and I am quoting from memory, so somewhat imprecisely, but he said in any case, and I am saying this very slowly now so that it can also be understood in Brussels, we will not go into this war. We will not allow ourselves, as Hungarians, as the Hungarian people, to participate in this madness. We want peace and not war. And Viktor Orban has been vilified for months as a... Viktor Orban wird seit Monaten niedergemacht als ein yes almost like a dictator which is complete nonsense because there were elections now and an opposition candidate immediately received almost 20 to 30 percent of the votes this is a sign that it is not a dictatorship but that democracy is still functioning at least in this regard if an opposition candidate, who was previously quite unknown, suddenly gets 20 or 30 percent of the votes, then it is still working. This smear campaign against everyone who says, stop this war, immediate negotiations, there must be a ceasefire, they are systematically being torn down. It is really bad now in Germany. When I observed the German media, after the European elections, suddenly everyone who did not vote for the traffic light coalition or CDU-CSU are labeled as right-wing extremists.
are all of them being branded as right-wing extremists. And because we have such a distinction between East Germany and West Germany, it is said everywhere in the Twitter bubble that East Germans are still all covert, stupid, freedom-hating. It's unbelievable. The same thing happened in France. The right-wing parties in France collectively received almost 40% of the votes. Macron then said in his speech, in which he announced the dissolution of the parliament, that we must now take up this fight against the right. He said the demagogues received almost 40% of the votes. That means he is labeling all these French voters, who together make up almost half of the French population, as demagogues. This is an incredible insult. This has nothing to do with democratic manners anymore. How is it possible that a head of state allows himself to be carried away to such an extent? The interesting thing is that at the moment, democracy in Europe is being most torpedoed by exactly those forces who loudly proclaim that we must protect democracy. They start to equate themselves and their own person with democracy. This means that anyone who does not share my opinion, who does not share my worldview, is not democratic. And that is the fundamental problem of any authoritarian thinking. Authoritarian regimes have always equated themselves with the will of the people. At the moment, the will of the people is being replaced by democracy. La démocratie, c'est moi. That's exactly how it is. Farewell Europe. That's exactly how it is. And what we are currently observing is a war hysteria that has also spread to the Swiss media. I remember that recently the editor-in-chief of the NZZ on Sunday wrote a sentence that was unbelievable to me. He wrote, we will finally have to decide now. Do you want more AHV? Do you want more pensions or more armament? We will have to decide. And of course, he was referring to this vote where the Swiss citizens voted for a 13th AHV. And it's so incredible what's happening there. When I read this sentence, do we want more armaments or more pensions, a historical echo immediately came to mind. Do you want butter or guns? This phrase immediately imposes itself. It is incredible how war enthusiasm is being fueled. And the media, of course, are at the forefront of this whole issue. The turning point has begun. That means everything that used to apply, detente policy, neutrality policy, is being thrown on the trash heap. Now we simply have to wage war and rearm. Yeah. Yes, I absolutely agree with you. You know, that's the terrible thing. We are currently seeing war euphoria in Europe again. I always have to say, in the First World War, the images that scared me the most were not the dead in the trenches or the battlefield. The worst images for me were those of the soldiers in Germany, France and England laughing and waving cheerfully at the camera as they boarded the train. They said things like, Christmas in Paris, or see you on the Champs-Élysées in three months. That was war euphoria. There was war euphoria everywhere, all over Europe, and Switzerland is included. We are sliding back into that. War is suddenly something great again. Something is happening. Yes, there is an iconography of war images that have become entrenched and taken on a life of their own. It's very interesting what you mention about the First World War. In the Iraq War, there were exactly the same images that were staged. I remember very well because I was working at the Tagesschau at the time. There were images of ships departing from a port in Great Britain. I don't remember which port it was. The ships were full of soldiers, and the mothers with their children stood on the quay and waved to the soldiers. The soldiers waved back from the ship. There was a huge crowd of people and a huge enthusiasm. 
Es gab genau die gleichen Bilder, die im Ersten Weltkrieg verwendet worden sind. There were exactly the same images that were used in World War I, restaged when it came to the Iraq War. That is also interesting. I experienced all of that. We know from history in Guatemala, or let's put it this way, Ray McGovern, a highly decorated CIA man, once told me, war is made with lies, war is made with lies. And he also says war is made with lies and refugees are made with war. That's how it works. We all know the military industrial complex that Eisenhower already mentioned. The arms industry profits from war. That is completely clear. I don't want to delve further into this topic right now. Although, maybe a very brief digression. In Ukraine, it's also about profit. What is largely kept under wraps here, or what the media should actually investigate but don't, is that by now the large agribusinesses have acquired so much farmland in Ukraine. This happened legally because the laws were changed. The area corresponds to the entire agricultural area of Italy. And behind these large corporations, of course, are the financial speculators and so on. We know that. I just want to say, Ukraine is the country on earth that has the most black soil areas. These are very humus-rich soils. These soils exist in a whole belt from the south of Russia to Ukraine. But Ukraine is the country that has the most black soil areas. No other country on earth has as much black soil as Ukraine. And of course, international corporations are already accessing this area in the middle of the war. This is a topic that simply does not interest our media. Lindsey Graham gestern oder vorgestern hat Lindsey Graham in den USA offiziell gesagt Lindsey Graham officially said yesterday or the day before in the USA in a major interview that it would be nonsense to give all the minerals lying in the Donbass to the Russians these minerals belong to the West and NATO and it would be foolish to leave them to the Russians this is now official it's not even hidden which is the crazy part all these considerations can be found on the internet this is not a conspiracy theory. Nevertheless, when it comes to what we should do now, everything is broken down to good versus evil. Then it is clear again, Russians bad, Ukrainians good, West good, and neutrality only for the good. That is the resolution of the whole concept. And Switzerland is right in the middle of this ideological dissolution process towards war euphoria. That is sad. So, to come back to the beginning of our conversation, it is completely incomprehensible to me how historians or reasonably rational thinking people can claim that we must decide in a war who the perpetrator and who the victim is, and then we must support the perpetrator. Neutrality should not prevent us from helping the victim and supplying weapons to punish the perpetrator. This is a logic of such stupidity and illogic that it simply takes one's breath away. This logic goes back to the Second World War, where it was so clear who the villain was, namely the Germans, the Nazis, and who ultimately was right. I believe this also has a lot to do with feelings of guilt, because so many deals were made with the Nazis back then. This keeps coming up. Also, this narrative that Putin is Hitler, everything is clear again. This Second World War has really damaged us extremely, in the sense that we then have to divide everything into good and evil again. And no longer in complexity. Yes, as if it were that simple. I just asked these people, how do you want to determine who was the good or the bad guy in the wars of the last hundred years? Who was the aggressor and who was the attacked? Who was the perpetrator and who was the victim? In Guatemala, when Jacobo Arbenz was overthrown, who only wanted to carry out a normal agrarian reform, as American specialists had also suggested. He was overthrown by the CIA under the pretext that they were communists. In Indonesia, in Cuba, during the Bay of Pigs invasion, a question of power, 
in Vietnam, in Nicaragua. In Nicaragua, I experienced it myself. I worked there during that time. In Nicaragua, a leftist government had come to power, and the USA was the first to set up a counter-revolutionary force, undercover, to overthrow this government. That was pure power politics. No one got upset about it. But in Panama in 1989, yes, a regime change had to be carried out. An airborne operation was initiated. The general who did not comply was captured and held as a prisoner in a U.S. prison until the end of his life. No one asked about international law. No one asked who the perpetrator and who the victim was. It is completely clear. How can one determine who was the perpetrator and who was the victim in Kosovo? There was an incredible public relations effort to portray the Serbs as the perpetrators because they allegedly had the horseshoe plan. They wanted to expel or even exterminate the population in Kosovo. This horseshoe plan later turned out to be fake. It did not exist in that form. The same could be shown for almost all conflicts of the last 100 years. It was very difficult, or there were lies and the real motives were concealed. It's about oil, strategic corridors, natural resources, as you very well said, but the population would not go along with it. You need the support of the population for a war. Even in dictatorships, it would be very difficult to wage a war if you were to say, we are attacking there because we want the oil or because we want to protect a sea route like in Yemen. We have to bomb there because it is an important sea route through which millions of tons of oil are transported daily. This sea route must not fall into the power of the Houthis and the Iranians. So we have to bomb Yemen. This Yemen war has already caused 400,000 civilian deaths. Where is the perpetrator and the victim? Why does the Swiss government remain silent? How are we supposed to imagine that? This madness from people who say we now have to name perpetrators and victims, therefore we can no longer be neutral. Then they should name perpetrators and victims, I always say. Then it's always me. In the wars of the last hundred years, the USA would very often be the perpetrator, if you will. At some point, Helmut, we need to bring these people into a conversation. That will probably be very difficult. I have found that it is difficult to convince these people to do an interview that is recorded but maybe we will manage it someday. We need to have this discussion. Switzerland is in the same war madness as the rest of Europe, unfortunately. For all the German colleagues who are listening to us, Helmut, I also thank you for writing this article and for allowing us to talk about it. Yes, okay, I hope you can use this. I will. Thank you and see you next time, Helmut. Bye. Okay, tschüss.